And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. He is the head of the Naval Academy. He is the, the man who... Who will, all, who will always laugh at Pax's naval naval policy, and the man who commands a who commands a fleet of warships, allegedly. The one, the one and only, the the man known as Grim, the man known as Grimoose on Twitter, Mr. Mark Kern. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great, Mildred. Thank you for inviting me into the monastery. It's nice and quiet here, uh, which is good because I'm on vacation. I'm taking a little little home vacation here. Mm -hmm. Which I think I think I think everybody needs at some at some point. Um, now it's now a bit of a tradition I have is the hum is the um, humble beginnings. So. Well, well, I'll open up. I'll open up with the video game side of thing. Then we'll kind of delve into tabletop because I like trying to integrate the two. Um, All right. When did the game design bug really start hitting you? Oh, geez. I think for me, it started at a very early age. I was, um, I was playing games on. You know, old, these are like old eight-bit computers, so like Atari and Apple IIs and things like that. I an Apple and I was doing that. Yeah, I love that thing. And uh, I started to tinker around in that in, in high school. I had to actually um, build my own, um, which you could at the time. I grew up overseas in Taiwan, and they were cloning all the motherboards and, 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 and machines there. So I bought like a motherboard, and I bought all the chips, and, I, and, I, and a friend of mine did this, and we soldered. We made two. One for each of us, and we, we we spent our weekends soldering up our computers and finally getting them to work, and um, and then I started to to write video games on basic on the Apple II, starting with my English class. I, I wrote like a project for Ulysses. I did a text adventure game as my thesis, and then uh, and that's how it started. So I was just making games in my spare time, and then through college, um, I got some of my first. Um, professional contact through AOL, and then in law school, I started working on my first game for Interplay. So it's just something I've always been doing with video games: is playing and making them uh, as, for as long as I can remember, and as long as probably computer games have uh, existed. If you discount like the Pong era or Space Wars era, yeah. Um now, one th one thing I will note about the Apple II era is um, the some of the educational games that were coming out around that time from uh, MECC. Those are still my gold standard for how you do an educational game without sucking at it. Yeah, I remember those. Um, everybody brings up the Oregon Trail because everybody likes to do the "Died of Dysentery" meme, but less people bring up Number Munchers. I don't I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I, I never, I've never played it. Um, I didn't play many educational software games unless they were required in school. Th those were the reason. I turned out okay. The reason why, um, the reason why I highlight those two is because those played like actual games. A lot of educational games, in my experience, come off as glorified flashcards. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Because and because of that, the uh, there's no real game in that game. Say so art games have the same problem. Yeah, they 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 sort of miss the gamification part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like they just said, well, if we just put up, um, you know, screens and 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 teach people like a PowerPoint presentation and then quit them, it'll all be good. And I think what MEC MECC did is that they really understood gaming, so. They actually got those interactive hooks in that would make you want to achieve more and more. And um, I don't know, as a category, I don't know what's happened to educational games. I guess it's all just apps now and websites. Um, I do think that the I think that um, like the the ones the educational game series that 
ended up dominating a good chunk a good chunk of my childhood was or at, le or at least one that was heavily advertised around that time was stuff like math blaster and i remember playing one of i remember playing one of them at like a day at like a daycare and i was just not impressed because of the because of the fact that it was like i said glorified flashcards um but but go but going beyond that now there's a now um there there are a couple of things that I did that I that I did want to ask regarding your regarding your time with Blizzard since earlier we mentioned one of the um pr one of the mm -hmm. um pranks that ha that happened um were you or were you around during the were you still still around Blizzard when the corrupted blood incident happened and if not um how did you hear about it Oh, uh, no, I had already left at the time. I left six months after we shipped World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I heard about the incident, and I was just laughing so hard because um, I remember... <clears throat> so for, for those of you who don't remember, Corrupted Blood was a a a, a, a debuff that, or, or a, a dot. It was a dot that went viral, and it started spreading with anybody nearby and started killing everybody in the game. And... You know, this was something that I remember our server programmer warning us about while we were making the game. And his name was Joe Rumsey, and he uh, was our server programmer, brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. And he he was telling us, we had asked him to create a scripting language that designers can use to sort of like, you know, uh, create advanced encounters and abilities and things like this. And, he, and I remember him saying, he's like, Mark, this is, this is going to be a problem. It's like one day we're going to get someone who who's untrained in programming and we're going to get something run away on the server and it's going to cause a lot of problems. And, and well, he was, <laughs> I guess he was right because we actually ended up having something like that happen. I, I heard about it like everybody else. I heard about it from, from, you know, uh, news and, um, and gaming websites at the time. And I thought, I thought it was just hilarious. I thought it was awesome. actually. Yeah. I know a few years later they tried to replicate something like that when, um, for, to draw a pipe for Wrath of the Lich King, and it didn't work because you can really only do that kind of thing once. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it's the sort of thing... Well, you know, it, it's cool when MMOs have these sort of unintended consequences, mm. right? I remember when Ultima Online came out and Richard Garriott did a big, you know, announcement in-game. I, I guess it was the game opening... And he was in his castle, and they managed to actually kill his avatar. And it was a, you know, it was completely unintended, and they had to shut the whole thing down and redo it. Um, but I just sort of miss these kind of weird, wacky things that can happen. You know, MMO design today, everything is very rigid. Um, there's there's not a lot of emergent stuff, and you don't get you don't get funny bugs like this quite as often as you do. And I kind of miss that. I kind of miss the the world being somewhat unpredictable and outside the bounds of the original design i'd say i'd say a big now i'm i'm only now obviously i'm looking at this from an outsider point of view but i'd say a, i'd say a bigger issue is um is a is a lot of a lot of designers really really being a little too fearful of tech if you're familiar with that term mm, no uh you don't, you don't mean technology? It's like an acronym for something, or it's not. It's not an acronym for some. It's just an. It's just a nickname for some. Tech is when when there's a certain when there's a certain technique or or a certain trick that um is discovered by the player base that the designers didn't intend. Um, okay. Two examples I can think of are things like wave dashing in Smash Brothers, or um B, or BXR in Halo Two. Okay, so basically, cheeses and exploits. That's what we used to call them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember in the case of something like Overwatch, there was there was an there was a, a bunny hopping exploit that people found with Mercy, and once and it only lasted about a day before it got before it immediately got patched out. And yep. <laughs> and. I remember thinking at the time, why'd you why why'd you pat why'd you patch that out? Leave that in there because the thing about some um, tech is that through that kind of thing you can you can create a kind of skill gap for for um 
for competition. Not in full, not in full on esports level competitive play, but just um, a skip, just a ge just a general divide between tho between those who are more adept with the with these systems and those who aren't. Yeah, there's always some players that are really good at min maxing and really good at finding um, unintended consequences in your games or exploit. And even at Blizzard, it's like there were a few go-to people that we had, and they weren't all designers, right? So a lot of the times they were, they'd be, you know, from other disciplines, art, or programming, or whatever, and they just had a knack for always finding the optimal way to do something that we didn't intend, and so we would always run some of our more complicated mechanics by uh, by these developers just to see what they could find. And we always sort of like valued them. They're very highly valued for finding these before, before they get out in the general public, you know, and then and, and be a real problem. When you make a game like an MMO that has an economy that you have to protect, that's that's pretty important that, that you don't let some of those unintended consequences go out if they affect the you know fundamentals of the game. Yeah, I, I remember that. Um, I remember that Eve had a few problems with some expansions that almost killed that game's in-game economy and. Um... I don't think you're gonna find a game that's hard, that's as hardcore about its in-game economy than um, Eve. You know, I could never get into that game. I tried, and it, and the moment where I had to like skill up and then wait for hours and check my app on my phone to see how I was progressing, <laughs> it was just I, I just ended up logging in just to do that and. Uh, and then you had to go train and get the, the skill book from some other far sector and mm -hmm. nothing would happen in the travel between there and there. I just could not get into it. But I was always fascinated by sort of the player politics and other things that evolved in that game. That was, I think, the true... That's the true strength of EVE Online. Yeah. And some there were some people that were arguing when they introduced skill injections into that game that they were turning it into pay-to-win, which... Um, the approach that I took with it is, on paper, yes, but in practice, it doesn't really come out that way because having a, having a big fancy ship on in Eve is, that you may have spent a whole lot of money for does not guarantee you're gonna you're gonna be all that successful, if unless you uh, absolutely know what you're doing. Because somebody who's in mm -hmm. a smaller ship who knows exactly what they're doing and knows how um, weapon dynamics are gonna work can beat you. And it's a real, it's a really high risk gamble because there, because um, it's not like you're just gonna respawn with that same ship, right? Like Don't you have insurance in that game? Oh, you, oh, you do. But even with insurance, you're still gonna be losing. You're still gonna be losing out, um, to to at least some to at least some degree. It's a very getting into fights is a very high risk affair which is the reason why there's the whole security thing like if like if you want to get right. you want to get the real nice um stuff you got to go into low sec you got to go into low sec but if they go into low sec you're going to have to deal with pirates right how how were the pirates i remember they they didn't have them at all when i was first starting in that game and they added them later is that like viable pve content in in eve online or do um, people just not really care about it Eve is when I now when I talk about pirates, I'm also talking about um, other players looking for a fight. And when it, the PVE part of it is all right, but I've always considered Eve to be a to be a PvP focused game. And it's a, the on, the only time that there was a real problem was the was when they added um, links. Which no, which nobody likes because the whole idea with Lynx was that it was a module you could put on your ship and you and it would carry a buff that you could share with the whole fleet. The thing is, though, it, they didn't they didn't specify how close to the other ships you had that the uh, Lynx ship had to be in order to apply the buff. So it could just hang out at a at a state at a station in that same system while everybody else is buffed. Oh no. Yeah, because of that for a while um low sec got the nickname of Link Sec. <laughs> um, and I can't I can't I can't blame him because that's something that's something that could be easily abused, especially if you've got a good enough fleet. 
and with but with that with that said, the other thing I I definitely wanted to ask was in regard to um to Diablo two now mm -hmm. the now the now the main question that I that I've always been that I've always been um, curious about is well first were you at were you at all involved with um, Lord of Destruction? Or was that, no, or was that I insane? only 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 the launch mm -hmm. game, because Blizzard North handled that mostly on their own. Uh, but for the launch, we were we were much more heavily involved. Uh, and um, so yeah, so I didn't work on the expansions, just the the original. Uh, all right. Um, what was? I know I know it's I know it's kind of a um, <laughs> kind of a. Kind of a mixed subject, but what was the what was the feeling at Blizzard regarding that whole Hellfire thing with the first game? Was it something that people people over there liked, or were they just indifferent to it? Mm, which Hellfire thing are you talking about? Um, the it was, expansion it was that expansion. Oh, that Sierra tried to make. Yeah, I remember that. Um, okay. Um... Well, I guess everyone who's who's worked on it is basically gone from Blizzard now, and including my former boss, Mike. Um, I, we had a big problem with anybody third party doing anything with our titles, so <clears throat> we're very protective of our quality. <clears throat> there was um, a lot of moaning and groaning about Hellfire, and um, it was it was just. It was just talked up as another reason why we we really should only do um, if it's our uh, if it's especially our IP then we should you know Blizzard should be the one to to handle everything about an expansion. So um, so no, it was it, it was a sore point inside Blizzard, and you know that's that had always been sort of the way of Blizzard is that we didn't really want anybody else to work on something because they didn't have the whole development you know there's conversations you have when you're making a game with a team and there are philosophies that you end up agreeing upon and reasons you make decision uh, a certain way sort of like a a body of knowledge that the entire team acquires through the development and the release and the, and the management of the game and when you have an external team new to it come into it they don't they don't understand all the decisions that led up to that point or why we did things a certain way and so inevitably you're going to get things that just don't make a lot of sense and or stand in opposition to some of the fundamentals that you laid out. I don't remember the specifics of, you know, which principles we felt were, 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 weren't uphold with Hellfire, but I do know that it's, it, it's something that we basically uh, have forgotten. <laughs> we didn't want to, we didn't really want that uh, to, to sort of be a Blizzard product. So. Yeah, it's it's something that it's something I've it's the sole the sole reason I ended up ha I ended up having is because when a uh, fr when an old friend of mine um was giving up a bunch of a bunch of PC games I ended up getting a bu I ended up getting a bunch from him um that include that included Diablo one and two and and uh, both Hellfire and then Lord of Lord of Destruction um because because uh, that was I was always curious about it, and then when I tried it out, I was like, "Oh, this is oh, this is why it's a sore spot because it wasn't that." G I got I got nothing but love for the people for the people who worked at Sierra over the years, but um, they did better things than that. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, like I said, it, it, you have some interesting things happening when you do this sort of outsourcing. thing. One is. Like I said, they don't have the body of knowledge that, develop, that the developers did, and so they don't understand why we did things a certain way. And so you can get conflicts that way. And the other thing is that they sometimes you get a third party and they want to like make their own mark on things. They want to spin things and have a, a vision, a creative take on something. And... Um, and that's that's not not what we were into at Blizzard. If we had a third party work on something, we wanted it to be to be very very faithful, and we did and we wanted more of the same, right? It, it, we wanted it's like, hey, do this, just do more of it, 
but then you you know but but creative people they, they want to sort of take things in their own direction and so there is these inevitable sort of creative conflicts that happen whenever you outsource your your main ip um i imagine that happens in tabletop too um in tabletop it's a little it's a little bit um interesting because i'd actually ar- i'd actually argue that um the third party is where things end up re- end up really thriving maybe not maybe Oh really? Maybe tell me, tell me about the, that. Maybe not in the business sense, but well, a mantra that I've had for years is the best way to experience D and D is outside of D and D because Dungeons and Dragons. And this is not. A, I want to make clear this is not a new thing. This is not something that's a result of of them get of them getting more them getting more um, NPC ish over the years. This is a problem that they have refused to address for a long time. They have a tradition problem, and because and because of the fact that they have this tradition problem, um, there are certain motifs and the like that, as time has gone on, don't fit the st- don't fit the style that they that they purport to um, use. It's kind kind of like how, if you look at the authors that served as D and D's inspiration. The only thing that they have in common is that they're fantasy authors, like guys, guys like Vance, guys, guys like Morcock, guys like guys like Howard. Like, there's not a whole lot that they have in common with each other. And in that in in that same regard, when you're working third party, because of the advantages of the open gaming license, you don't have to worry about the about those um, traditions. You can ha- you can have things that break that break away from those traditions, and you'll be all the better for it. Now, that was, I mean, that was very interesting when three point five went open like that, and that was like a great explosion uh, in tabletop when that happened. That was a really smart idea. It was, uh, yeah, but I think it, I think it was more for the better. Um, it, it definitely. Well, the reason I say for better and for worse is the years between 2000 and 2005 are what I like to call the OGL bubble. Um, because just everybody was put was trying to put out some sort of D20 product. And as Sturgeon's Law would dictate, most of them kind of sucked. Mm-hmm. Like these... Like the... For every for every good or interesting project, like say Slayer's D twenty, you had some, you had something like De- like Deadlands D twenty or L or L five R D twenty, which is in and hell L five R second edition is in the halls of we don't talk about that. <laughs> okay. Well, in that in that particular case, they tried to they tried to have um have both roll and keep and D twenty supported in the same books. The problem with mm-hmm. this is, well, there's nothing that Roll and Keep and D20 have in common. Yeah. Like, I mean, the what, what's that, a D, what's a D20 rule set that you that you liked? What do you think was a good spin off of that? Um, there's a few there's a few examples I can think of. Um, in that during the, during the OGL bubble, I re- I really liked um. I really liked Iron Heroes because I thought it was addressing the low a yeah, low fantasy angle without um without completely removing options the way a lot of OSR games were doing and some of them still are doing like the whole that's the reason I have a love hate relationship with the OSR because um it seems that the mindset of let's let's make it let's make a tougher breed of fantasy is remove is removing options which on paper is one of those things where it's like you don't you can still you can still do a tougher breed of fantasy without having to do that like those two things aren't mutually exclus- exclusive um i really really love um fantasy craft which basically took um the d20 system blew it up and reconstructed it from the ground up um hmm. for ex- I, i've never tried it um 
a few examples on on what on some of the stuff it did is um the fact that feats are far better organized like in, instead of <laughs> having it jumbled all over the place they have feats organized into subcategories so it so you remember how for uh, fighters in 3.5 um you got you you got a you got a, a bonus feat every other level and you you and all the feats would have to be listed about whether or not they counted as a bonus feat for fighters yes you don't really have to do that with fantasy craft because you because you could just say okay at these levels you get say a melee combat feat so if so if something gets expanded and and a new melee combat feat is added you don't have to list that it counts as a bonus feat for a given class okay Plus, when it came to feat chains, a lot of them are just three tiers. Um, basics, Mastery, Supremacy. Which, one, works really well for keeping things alphabetically organized, and two, you don't have to deal with some of the ridiculous prerequisites for feats that happened in um, 3.5. The Yeah, it was kind of a maze. Well, um, part of the reason... Part of the reason it was that kind of a maze was because of um, of Monty Cook's attitude at the time. Like he he had this mindset that system mastery should be rewarded and system ignorance should be punished, which I don't agree with. Because because um every every game is gonna be someone's first. Mm, right. Like how, like how Stanley said, every comic's gonna be someone's first. And as far as the prerequisite thing, the um, the punching bag for me as as a as an example of why having too many prerequisites is a bad idea was whirlwind attack in in uh, vanilla thir- in vanilla three point five. Because mm-hmm. you needed you needed to have a dex and an intelligence score of at least thirteen. You needed to have a base attack bonus of plus four, and you needed to have combat expertise, dodge, mobility, and spring attack. Right. Which that's a lot. The problem that I have with those with those kind of approaches is you need to you need to plan out how you're going how you're going to be getting it from a very early level, and I prefer letting people um, go in kind of go in kind of free form. Instead of feeling they have to plan how they're going to advance for the next six levels or something, because um, that's not fun. Well, <clears throat> there is a particular type of player that really enjoys that, though, that enjoys poring over the rule books and plotting the ideal path and coming up with a a broken build, right? Oh, oh, there's def there's definitely those, and there's. There's always been stuff like that, or the legend of Pun Pun or Co- or Godzilla, where people try and break the game as hard as they can. Um, I think that that around the table, though, mm-hmm. you know, even if it's not breaking the game, let's just say they they they've mastered the system and they know how to optimize their character. Mm-hmm. It kind of sucks when you're sitting around the table and combat occurs, and the one guy who's figured it all out is outperforming everyone by an order of magnitude, right? Yeah. That's So it, it I think that's the downside of that. Oh, it it definitely is and it, and I'm not saying it's an easy tightrope to balance. Um, but I do vehemently disagree with people like John Wick who seem to have this mindset that balance isn't necessary. Um, <clears throat> putting aside the fact that he that um when he introduced void magic and some during his time with Legend of the Five Rings, people got on him for making it OP. I mean, on one hand, it's void magic, but on the other hand, the only people who are really going to be using void magic are the Phoenix Clan. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those glass houses kind of thing. Like, you shouldn't be complaining about game balance being unnecessary when you're known for making things broken. <laughs> it's I I I I'm actually at least in video games I feel balanced is overrated. Um, and tabletop, you know what what sort of balance are you talking about? Like the you know one build being as effective as another build, or because uh, it's not PvP you're talking about. So 
Um, Explain a little more about what you mean by balance in, in tabletop. What I mean by balance in ta- in tabletop is making it so that one particular place, one particular um, play style, or one particular build isn't being treated as the star of the show. Um, I had a sh- during my time with third edition, I had a short list of sp- of um, spells for in both the arcane and divine sense that I refused to allow um, players to access. For the sole reason that I felt that they were either dipping into the territory of other classes, or they were robbing um, the GM of narrative control, um, things, or if I did, you, or if I did allow them, I'd put certain caveats in the house rules. Um, a good example of this was teleport, because my mindset was, what, why, why should I allow this when when somebody could use this to just skip to just skip over whole swaths of adventure, from especially since if I'm doing say like say a hex crawl where a go where going from place to place and dealing with random encounters is part is part of the um, campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, scrying is scrying was also was also something. Plus, I didn't like having to do the way is unclear thing all all the time when I needed to improvise. Um, but more egregious examples were things like knock, because there's the mindset of, well, why do I why do I need to have a rogue in my party to pick locks when I can just have the spellcaster cast knock and the door is unlocked? Right. Um, that's the kind that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about when it comes to balance. My the ideal for balance is not that every character is the same. But rather that every character has something to do, and oh, go ahead. A good chunk of that is is on is on the GM's shoulders of make of making sure that the that there is a kind of harmony in the adventure design and with the players. I.e., it's important to read the room. But I do I do think that back in now. Um, that when it came to three point five, and when it came to some, when it came to some other instances, there were certain archetypes that were getting more attention than others. Like in three point five, if you were if you were a um, if you were just a pure fighter, you were going to be a one trick pony for the majority of your career. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, <clears throat> that's something that we deal with all the time in games. Is um, in video games is the is. When you start, especially in MMOs, when you start prioritizing solo ability, you start to get a homogenization of the classes. You know, everyone's got some form of healing, everyone's got this and that. But what's really more interesting to me is if you know the game is going to be played in a group setting, like a tabletop game, and there's going to be interdependencies, then you, you, it's more interesting to have players take on different roles. Now the question is: Is you know, the problem is, is that when you when you start to do that, when you start to introduce interdependencies and and synergies, is that you know one class does this and the other class can do that, and then combined they they have they're extra effective at accomplishing whatever. Uh, the problem is, is that then you get group composition issues. It's like, well, we have to have this and we have to have that, or we're just not going to be that effective. Yeah, that and that that manifested itself in the um in the cleric healbot problem. Yes. The so you know the, the the trick is 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 to introduce enough uh, synergies and interdependencies to make it fun, but not so much that you you end up you know. Um, well, it depends what you're playing for. In tabletop, are you really gaming to to win, or are you gaming for the story? I guess that's the question. Is it you know is it really more about the mechanics and 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 overcoming? Because as a DM, I'm always I'm always fudging it in favor of the story. If a player wants to do something cool, or you know, or it would be awesome if if this took this turn because of this die roll, then I'll go ahead and do it, right? And and I won't strictly adhere um, to you know the actual outcome of the dice. It's but when they're privately rolled dice, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's you versus the DM. It's like I'm always going for what's going to be more entertaining for my players. What's going to be more interesting? So, when you play it that way, I don't think you have to worry too much about group composition. But if you're if you have the type of group that's really in it to sort of like 
have really tough challenges and overcome them and and demonstrate their knowledge of the rules and how they overcome them then then you're playing a different type of campaign mm -hmm. i don't know which one's more popular or prevalent it seems like we're moving much more toward story-based stuff uh but you tell me you have far more experience with with the current tabletop community than i do um as I, I've heard I've heard the whole thing of we're of we're moving more towards um, story based stuff. I I feel I feel like I feel like this I feel like the move towards sto move towards um story based stuff is not exactly what people think it is. Like for, and I've se I've seen the I've I have seen the rise of things like um. Of things like Sa of things like Savage Worlds and things like Powered by the Apocalypse, what I do what I do see is um is some people is some people wanting to focus more on story, and I'd say that ha I'd say the story focus thing is more of is more of a consequence of pe of people trying to jump on the streamer bandwagon, um, and not re oftentimes not realizing that what they're watching when they watch something like. Critical role is a show, not a representation of what it's actually going to be like at the table. And I've had to correct my students on this many times over over the last few years. But there's also the there's also the fact that I think there will always there will always be a certain place for that for that he for that crunch heavy approach. And I think a lot I think a lot of people are assuming that because of there's this there's this um push towards um more narrative influenced uh style of games that that that, that means that crunch is something that needs to be avoided which to me is seeing the forest for the trees what need what i'd say needs to be what i'd say needs to be avoided is unrefined degrees of crunch or crunch with, crunch in places where it's not going to contribute um like this is like if you tried to do well, a... isn't that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you mentioned OGR earlier, right? And uh, and if you go back to to the original like D and D second edition or whatever, um, it, it it's a bit of both, right? It, what I find kind of like a paradox is is people in OGR want more crunchiness in certain areas but they also want more openness to do things that are not anticipated so that's a dichotomy that i don't quite understand yet it's like where do people want you know more crunch and where do people want the rules just to be more like a skeleton or a guideline to let the dm Im improvise on top of to be to be honest the the real trend that i that i've been seeing is is more is more on the lines of creating a tailored experience. Um, now I'll, I'll use the I'll use the concept of an anime TRPG as an example for this. When I was when I was first right. com when I was first coming up, and there were games like Big Eye Small Mouth um, coming around. Um, that that was more the ex that was more the expected idea. This notion that um, if you're going to do a RPG based on anime, it had to be this separate thing with its own approaches, which is a pet peeve of mine personally, be for the same reason that I can't stand, um, animation being referred to as a genre. It's not a genre, it's a medium. Anyone who tells you it's a, it's a genre is dead wrong. Yep. And I agree with that. As, as time has gone on, and I... I'm not sure if I can credit the fact that more Japanese tabletop have co have come to the have come to the West in the, in the last five years, but I've seen but I've seen a trend of more of more directed experiences. For example, instead of trying to have games that encompass all of anime, you have ones that are trying to go for a specific style. Um, a recent example that I've covered would be Battle Century G. Which is all about trying to ca capture a lot, capture a lot of the, um, a, a, a lot of a lot of mech, a lot of mech styles in the vein of um, Super Robot Wars, which was the original inspiration for it when it was when it was a project on TG. Um, yeah. You've got something like Bounty Head Bebop, which, with a name like that, you can probably figure out what its inspirations are. <laughs> um, yeah. 
you and you've and then you've and then on the Japanese side of things, you've got things like Tokyo Nova or or uh, Tenra Bancho Zero or Golden Sky Stories. None of these are all encompassing, but they're focused on a certain type of experience and building their mechanics around that experience. This is also the reason why I think that anybody who says that you can that you can run just about anything by just ha by just hacking D and D really needs to get their head examined, because while D and D can do a lot of things, it has its limits. What What do you think? Like, what's the, an example of D and D hitting its limits? D and D cannot handle skills. It was never designed to be a skill-based game. And when it tried integrate cuz obviously if, if you look at ori if you look at orig original all the way up to advanced second, the closest thing to skills was the class ability for the thief and and thief derivative classes like say the monk. But when they when they integrated a full-on skill system with third edition, it didn't qu it it isn't quite as naturally integrated as skill as a skill system you might see in say Shadowrun or World of Darkness or Traveler, games that are built around <laughs> their skill systems from the get go. The yes. uh, the other thing is that D and D is is very is very much rooted in a European style of fantasy. Mm -hmm. And while there's been attempts to break away to break away from that, you you cannot break away from that with with just reskinning. Like I remember one excerpt in the Dungeon Master's Guide in Fifth Edition that was really dumb, where they tried to argue that you could just reskin the Paladin in order to make a samurai character. And <laughs> I'm sitting here going, no, because. When's the last time you saw someone wielding a shield in um, in a Japanese period drama? Like the closest thing I could find to some equivalent of a shield was a um, was this turtle shell shield thing that was only used in Okinawa, which is and given how Okinawa is a um, is a story in and of itself, that's not really that's not really going to be applicable. And when you consider the fact that you that um that full that full on steel wasn't as commonplace in Japan as it might have been in Europe, um, you run into other problems. So, I think it's it, it, you know I, I do think that well this this gets into another topic. The games that have a a world setting. Mm -hmm. and whose game mechanics are tailored and enhance that world setting, I find very powerful. But that's where, you know, um, it's not, you, you can't just easily go in and read again because they're tightly integrated together and they sort of reinforce each other. But I know that a lot of people, you know, let's we'll call them the, you know, more on the GURP side of things, right? It's just give me a universal system and let me put my own universe on top of it. Where, where do you fall on that spectrum? Um, with a lot of things, I fall, I fall, ex I fall exclusively in the, in the middle of things. Um, when it comes to, when it comes to, when it comes to universal systems like GURPS or HERO, um, the, the the approach that I've had is I I do not treat those games like games. When somebody buys a copy of GURPS, I treat that like they're buying a license for the Unity engine, for instance. You're not mm -hmm. buying a game; you're buying the means to create the game that you in, that you intend to. And while you can do a lot of stuff with um, GURPS, there is there is still going to be the barrier to entry because due to the sheer amount of stuff you can do. You're going to have um, what I've come to call choice paralysis or swim, damn it. Um, Savage Worlds has this problem as well, but to a much lesser degree because it's going to be a simpler game than, mm -hmm. than GURPS or um, Hero. 
but it, it but it is something you have to take into account. The that that pure flexibility is going to come with a price tag. And at the same time, going with going with something a lot more structured that uses class systems and, and the like is also going to come at the cost of flexibility to a point. Where I stand is right in the middle between those two extremes. This is this is the reason why I absolutely adore Thirteenth Age and recommend it to everybody I can, because of the fact that even though it has its um, particular setting, and even though it has its particular class system, because of how talents work in that, and and the way that they did a icon system instead of the alignment um, system, gives it a lot gives it a lot more flexibility, but it's flexibility within a certain net. So you're not com so you, so somebody can jump in and not be completely lost. That's so, go ahead. So you're you're kind of in the middle, and yet you know what I'm what I'm hearing from you is like saying you know hey, when when you bring over say Japanese themed RPGs or you know or it's time to do a samurai that it's better to have a rule set that sort of springs from that sort of setting rather than one that that you're trying to graft onto it. And I is that is that an accurate assessment of, of what you're saying? Yeah, the the approach the way I the way I go with the way I go with my approach is that I am a tailor. And and as a t and that's that's also the reason why whenever I've done reviews of games, I don't do I don't do it by a scoring by a by a numbered scoring metric anymore. I haven't done that in I don't know. I don't know about six years, maybe maybe even more than that. Because well, for one, I, f I find I find the num I find the numbered metric thing um, kind of pointless, and I find it causes more problems than it solves. Instead, I use instead I use a broad tiered approach of who would I be willing to recommend this to, like who would who would get who would get the most out of this particular style of play, and. To the and to that end, it's the approach that that's why the approach that I prefer is one where you are tail you are tailoring the mechanics to the type of experience that you intend to make. Um, there's a, there's a three question paradigm that that's that I've seen shared I've seen shared around in game design circles, and maybe you're familiar with this, where there's three questions you've got you've got to answer before you start. And I think I tested this on you once. It's what is your game about? How does it go about being that? And what behaviors does your game try and encourage and discourage? Yeah. Because because those are good questions. Mm -hmm. Because you need to have that you need to have that kind of thing um, nailed down in order to in order to get that particular vibe. Now I've used L five R as an example because we're both familiar with that in, in one form or another. But L5R, mm -hmm. even with its even with its combat aspects, does lend it is lending itself more to political intrigues, and in fact, go, going into the whole going into the whole murder hobo style combat is actively discouraged. So if somebody likes do, if somebody likes doing combat centric ones where you're just going into places and k killing things and taking mm -hmm. their stuff, I wouldn't recommend L5R to them. Right. Whereas if they yeah, it, have a background in say game, if if they if they're a fan of say Game of Thrones or or a similar kind of show, then I'd be a little more willing to do that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, and and it's definitely uh, you know, seems to be. I, I've only played the the card game, mm -hmm. so um, you know, I've had a copy of the rules a long time ago. Um, but I never really, I, I never really gained a session or uh, did more than than through them. But that's interesting that they would, you know, like what do you, what type of gameplay do you want to see emerge out of this rule set? And for them, it was like you said, the political intrigue, and so everything sort of catered around that. Which probably means, does that mean that combat in L five R suffered, or if it, it, it was just a kind of like a, a quick death thing and and with severe consequences, like say rune quest. You know, you go into a rune quest fight, you're going to lose an arm or an eye. <laughs> Um, com combat in L5, I wouldn't say combat in L5R suffers, 
because there because there are going to be combat there are going to be combat opportunities especially 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 when um if someone's honor is sl is sufficiently slighted you can always challenge them to a, a duel and while duels are usually done to first blood sometimes they're not and of and of course given that I'm given um a given that I ran scorpion in my in my time um, sometimes during a duel, accidents happen. Quote unquote. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but the th the thing the thing about co the thing about combat with it is that it's is it is meant to be quick, it is meant to be lethal, and it is meant to ha to have a degree of consequence. Um, the especially especially since. Even even at high, even at high insight ranks, you can go down pretty quickly. Especially since there is <laughs> a series of escalating penalties as you take damage. It isn't a, so. This isn't a case where you're going to be tanking it. It um. The the kind of keep in mind that the big inspiration for L five R was the fact that the uh, developers were big were big fans of of um. Kurosawa films, as any, yep. as any man of culture would be, and so and when you look and when you look at combat in those in those particular films, it's always very very quick, usually a few strikes and that's it. Yeah. It's well, I cool. mean, uh, I, I I actually hired the designer of L five R card game, Dave Williams, and 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 he actually does practice uh, Japanese martial art. Right, so he was he was definitely into the the sword aspect of it. <clears throat> yeah, and of course, the thing the thing is when whenever I um whenever I'd run um campaigns, there might be several sessions where nobody even draws their sword. Um, and usually usually when so when swords are drawn, it's been it's been it's been built up to it's been built up to that point. There are mm -hmm. methods of 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 making it more um of making it more combat focused if you want like say well you're you're familiar with the you're familiar with the Caillou wall with the crab clan right yeah yeah um a an easy combat focused story that that one could take is something like say twenty goblins winter. I.e., if you can go if you can go on the other side of the wall and kill, kill twenty goblins and come back, then you're a member of the Crab Clan. No questions asked. Mm -hmm. Because, well, when you're defend when you have to defend against undead oni and worse for 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 over a millennium, you can't afford to be picky about who you let do it. It's like, can you hold the sword? Good. Welcome to the clan. <laughs> So that's cer that's certainly a method, but there's still that kind of danger because you are still venturing into the Shadowlands, the closest place to hell on the in anywhere near the Empire. So that, but that's one that's one that's one approach that can be done. It's not it's not what would be considered the default, but it is a potential angle. Mm -hmm. So. What type of games do you gravitate towards? I mean, let me, let me phrase this another way. <clears throat> what do you think it takes for uh, a game, a new tabletop game, to sort of like achieve success? And I guess we could talk about success in two ways. One is where do you? What types of games do you see succeeding in, um, let's say, the niche market that really find a niche and then and blossom into it and have a very strong foothold there mm -hmm. with a user base? And which ones do you think are succeeding more on the mass market side of things? This is where this is where it gets tricky, and I will tell you the biggest lie that I that I have heard, that I have heard over the last five years. And it's a it's a lie that I especially have heard in the last in the last few years. Is this notion that tabletop gaming is becoming more um, accepted? That is not the case. Not when it, not when it comes to the um, gr the grand sw the grand swath of the market. Tabletop. The thing the thing is is that 
in video in video in the video game scene, you have a, you have a much more healthy dichotomy. You have you have the AAA, you have the indies. For a while, you didn't have the double A indie things, but that's slowly been coming back. Yep. When it comes to the tabletop end of things now, it's not as healthy. You basically ha- you basically have the big two with the big three. I'd say with um, Pat with D and D, Pathfinder, and and Warhammer Forty Thousand role play. Was and if, which um, which much which the that took was, off? Huh? That took off. Um, it took forty k role play. It took off really well when during the during the run with um Fantasy Flight Games with stuff with um Dark Heresy, Only War, Black Crusade, and 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 that group. To the point. Okay. The point that it, to the point that it. Was, I didn't it know was, it, it achieved scale on a, on on the same footing as as say Paizo. I thought it was still kind of niche. Um, it is to it is to a degree, but um. But it's in, it's in like it's in like the third place for for a while. Um, now that the lights, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how this is going to pan out with um, Wrath and Glory. Now that the license is moved over to Cubicle Seven, whose work I do like. Um, and while I like um, Wrath and Glory, I'm interested to see how it develops with time. But the pro- the problem is is that if is that if you are if you're in the independent end of things. It's a it's a lot harder to get that kind of attention because so much of that attention is dominated by Wizards of the Coast and Paizo. That's also that's also the reason why I have such a um I have such a hostile relationship with with um people who who go who um who claim to be these long t- who claim to be these longtime fa- fans of the hobby and yet all that I see them playing is j- all that I see them doing is just watching critical role or or something like that and I'm like don't lie to me man <laughs> and that that's that's also part of the reason I not to toot my own horn but that's part of the reason I started my channel was to show what else is out there because there's a lot out there you're right it seems like it's really split between hey I play D&D and everybody else <laughs> yeah there, there's the and um the big pro- the big problem in in that case of hey I play D and D is that a lot of times they come off not as playing but just using it as a lifestyle brand like the like the kind of person who would um who would unironically say Wakanda forever and yet has never read a black co- pla- Black Panther comic in their life. Mm-hmm. I only point that out because I had to deal with that cringe personally. <laughs> um. So what is you know. Mm-hmm. And yet, you still have plenty of independence, but um, but it seems like feast or famine. Like if you if you're not one of the or doing stuff for the big big two systems or big three systems, uh, you, you're pretty much in a uh, a money loss situation. As if if you're treating it as an endeavor, it's it's at least for me that's the way I look at it. You know, I'm I'm, I'm making a a passion project, a tabletop, and most, most uh, people who are in the independence. Um, are making are making it as a passion project, like the majority of the people I've had on who who are ma- who are making either th- even and even third party D and D stuff is not immune to this. Um, like there's like I mentioned there's even with them um, fifth edition there's some really good th- there's some really good third party material either out or on it or on its way out that is not getting the attention because for a lot of people it's all it's all about the it's all about that first party. And the thing, the thing that the thing that I I am noticing about that first third party um, dichotomy is the fact that a lot of the people who are who um, are going into development in that in that um, third party are doing so because they don't feel satisfied with what the first party is offering. Um, I bring up um, friend of the show Ash of Creativity. And in his case, the the thir- the um the first party wasn't fulfilling certain play styles that he wanted to address, and mm-hmm. the mindset that that um, Wizards of the Coast had was, well, we left we left it blank so people could come up with come up with that on their own. 
which is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna have people come up, come up with their own ideas on that front, give them at least some guidelines to do it. Don't just le- don't just give them a blank page and say swim, damn it. Um, mm-hmm. But it is it is most while well, there while well, um back in the back in the eighties and and nineties and even a bit of the two thousands, someone someone could jump in and make a bu- and make a bunch of money through. Through a tape, through specifically tabletop, that's not really the case anymore. Um, a lot of people are doing it either as passion projects, or you've got people who are um, le- who are legacy fo- who are legacy folk within the with within the grand scheme of things. Like say um, Onyx Path, even though they've um, fall- even though they've fallen by the wayside in, for- in terms of my respectability for them, and that has it has less to do with um. Is less to do with their current politics and more to do with how they run their business, um, or you and of co- and of course there's still there's still places like Steve Jackson and and the like who are pu- who are putting out respectable products. It's just that because of, because of how open the market is these days, where anybody can make it, it, it anybody can make material. It is harder to get yourself noticed. Um, that's the mm-hmm. reason why I do, that's the reason why I um I have this channel and why I do and why I do so many um interviews to try to try and mit, to try and mitigate that in my own little way. I think um you got to you also have a, a a group of players and and I'm probably guilty of of being among them where um I like I I like buying the rule sets of a bunch of games, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'll I'll collect books and more recently I've gone digital with a lot of this stuff because just shelf space. Uh, but I'm only really playing what my friends play, which is D and D or uh, Pathfinder. Uh, and it, it occasionally I'll get them to try something like you know I ran a Spycraft D twenty campaign for a while. But you know what I end up playing just because of what everybody else plays and. Uh, is different than what I'm collecting, but I'm still collecting these rule books. And I think a lot of people collect rule books. Um, There's, you know, and that oh, go ahead. Is, that is very much a um, that's that's very that's very much a cycle that feeds into itself. Um, and that was the reason why when I um the last time I last time I did a D and D specific video, I said. D and D fifth edition is 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 the is an example of it's not popular because it's good it's good because it's popular. Um, because you def you and moreover with a lot of the people who fall into that trap, the thing that I definitely noticed is that they're all playing um vanilla or first party material. I'm not going to say all of them. I'll say the majority of them. I'll try and cover my ass to a degree. But that's mm-hmm. the tr- that's the trend that I often see with this kind of thing. You've got a lot of people who do just the who um who because of the, because of the because of the fact that the options have been made have been made available to them um st- um stick to the familiar. Um, that's also the reason to th- to that end. I would be remiss if I did not note um, free, that free RPG day is a thing, and and it's one of those things that when when you when we start seeing more LGSs um, open up open up more and more as the as the whole pandemic ev- eventually dies down, um, mm-hmm. I do enc- I do encourage people to do that kind of thing. And the other thing that has been really interesting in term in terms of trends that I've seen. Is effectively effectively rent a game places. the The idea being you pay a, you pay an upfront fee, and for a certain amount of time, you um you can you can rent out a room to play a specific board game or an RPG. Um. Here in here in Minnesota, a a there's a few of the, there were a few of those in uh in the uptown St. Paul area, and Fantasy Flight Games has an event center. Up in um, up in Roseville specifically for that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. 
the yeah i i but it that's hmm, how does that work because it, it takes a while to to digest a rule set and to and to get a campaign together or an adventure together so how does that work when you're just renting those games like um now granted you, is it like a library do you get to bring the books home for a while and um, return no, them or like no a lot of a lot of times what a lot of times what what people will do now when it comes to board games that's obviously going to be self-contained um although with cert with certain board games like the world of warcraft board game i'd probably ask for extra time just with all the setup <laughs> You probably saw that board game. That thing is massive. Yeah, it is. Um, but a lot of times, people will people will bring in their people will bring in their own little binder and just use just use that space. Um, so so they ha so they have a particular place where it's not where it's not um all everyone's visiting someone's apartment or something. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> and from what I've and from what I've heard now, granted. Take this with a big grain of salt, but there's a similar kind of thing that goes on in Japan, where that where um people will rent out, say, a karaoke room, and in yep. both of those cases, well, first off, there's the majesty of these little things called quick starts, that are that are self-contained advent, they're self-contained adventures that usually have their own set of pregens, um. You end up seeing you end up seeing quick starts or one shots a lot with uh, Japanese tabletop. At least the um, little that I've seen. I'm not going to claim to be an expert on that field because I've only played like s six um, Japanese tabletops over the years. Okay. And that's the approach that I t that I tend to see, where you've got pe where you've got people who do the who do this sort of. Um, Rent, renting out the place already ha already have some of the things pre-planned maybe maybe if they're old school enough they'll have a bo they'll have a box of index cards too and they just and they just go with that um okay. but i i'm not sh i'm not sure where i'm not sure where that kind of thing is going to be and obviously the other the other tr the other trend that's being seen is the rise of um virtual tabletop yeah, especially now because of game rooms being closed. I mean, my local game store, their their gaming room is closed. Um, you know, uh, do you see a lot more people going to sites like Roll Twenty? Yes, in a word, yes. Roll Twenty had Roll Twenty has um has had it has had its stuff balloon significantly since the pandemic started. Um, and the same, the same, the same upward trend goes with uh, goes with other virtual tabletops, like fa like Fantasy Grounds, um, the recently released Astral, and um, I've never heard of these. Are they are, are they big? Um, are they as big as Roll Twenty? I wouldn't. They don't have. They don't have the they. The they Fantasy Grounds. I'd say is the se I'd say is the second largest and. I'd say that Fantasy Grounds is is most definitely for people who want to um want to go a little more in depth with how they customize stuff. Um especially especially since um unlike unlike Roll20 or Astral, um Fantasy Grounds has Steam integration and they're work and they're working on a version of it that'll be using Unity. The th Oh, it's a Unity app. Um it wasn't it wasn't originally but they are de they are develop they are developing a unity version they did they did a Kickstarter for that about a year ago the, and then they they've got okay mm -hmm. the thing the thing is though um fantasy grounds is gonna t is gonna take a bit of work the thing that I have noticed though is the majority of the people who use fantasy grounds use it more for savage worlds than anything else hmm Okay. I'm not sure if that I'm not sure if that's my own experience bias or if that or if that's the general trend though. So take that with a grain of salt. So what's their what's their business model? These are subscription based sites. Roll twenty that integrate... is a subscription based approach. Um, Fantasy Grounds is is a um is a buy to play approach effectively. 
There's the free version where you can jump into anybody anybody's um, campaign, but you can't set up a campaign yourself. And then there is the paid there's the paid version that is a little bit more expen more expensive than Roll Twenty. But once you've bought the full license, that's all that's all you that's all you need. You're not going to do with any sort of monthly thing. Right. So some and and what about Astral? That's that's new to the scene, huh? Astral, I haven't I haven't looked too deep into because it's still relatively young. It's only it's only been around for a couple of years, and the main thing that it boasts is having interactive items, um, as opposed as opposed to the more st the more static assets that you're gonna see in roll in roll twenty or um fantasy grounds. Right. Um but in the case of Astral, I believe it's up it's operating under the same model that Roll Twenty does, where it's a monthly subscription. Yeah, I'm on their site now and it's I guess you can create a free account mm -hmm. um and uh you get some storage with that and then you can upgrade to a pro which is eight twenty five a month, mm -hmm. which gives you access to uh, 12,000 tiles, tokens, sounds, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And uh, so you're, you're seeing these sites explode now with, with COVID, right? Yeah, although I'd, I would argue that, these, that, this, that this rise in popularity was going to happen regardless. COVID was just an accelerant. As it is with many things, yes. I mean, uh, remote education, for one. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I think it was because we were already struggling to find people to play with, right? And when you limit it to just your physical location, that really limits. Like, like for me, I like trying. I would love to try out some of these rule books that I have sitting on my shelf. But if I just look around at my friend base, they're not. You know, it would take a lot of convincing to get them to try. But if I'm online. I can just instantly find the community for that game and arrange a session no matter where they are in the world if I wanted to try that. There are plenty of sites dedicated just to helping people find groups. Um, Roll20 has an entirely separate subreddit called, um, Roll, called Roll20 LFG. That is, that, is all, that is all about that kind of thing where somebody will... And even on the Roll20 official forums... There's plenty of threads where people will put up looking for groups saying, okay, he, okay, here's what we want to do. Here's how many slots we've got. Here's the general tone of the game. Here's the system that we're using um, and what and what sort of ex, what sort of level of experience they prefer. That makes sense. Um, I, w I would suggest that people actually integrate with Discord. Um, so there are there uh, have been. There have been some there have been some attempts to to integrate with Discord, and Discord does have um, die rolling bots that can, that can be accessed. Now, I personally don't 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 use them because um, when I'm using something like Roll Twenty, that already has a die rolling app, so there's not much, there isn't much point. Oh, I I don't mean to 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 play the game. I, I mean I I still think that having something that's got dedicated features like Roll Twenty. Uh, you know, uh, is a is a much more effective way to do that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in terms of what you said about finding communities, right? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. I've been playing a lot of Deep Rock Galactic, which is an indie uh, mining game mm -hmm. with with dwarves, and you go in with four space dwarves, and you're sitting there mining out caverns together. You can actually in their Discord. Uh, they have different channels. So when you get to a certain state of the game, you have to choose a guild and you get put into that guild channel. But they also have uh, group invites. So if you're looking for a player, it's integrated with Discord so that that message pops up in Discord and whoever clicks on it can join your game. That might be kind of cool for a tabletop session. It's like, hey, you got together, but one of your guys is sick. You need a fourth player. Rather than posting to Reddit and saying, hey, I need someone who can't respond instantly, you could have it post and, and you could have roll, something like Roll20 integrated with Discord mm -hmm. so that it actually posts an invite link and someone could just click it and say, yeah, if you're looking for, you know, a fighter or a cleric or whatever, sure, at this level, I'm in and then join the game. Um, I've heard I've heard I've heard that there's attempts to integrate D&D Beyond in, in this sense. The only problem I have with um be with beyond is the is the fact that 
I'm not entirely con- I'm not entirely convinced that that um D and D Beyond is willing to support custom content. Um, oh, you're, you're talking about the the app, right? Yeah, D and D Beyond and the website, which has all the license rule books for um, for fifth edition and that app. Boy, uh, you know what? I, I I love and hate that app. Um, it it was so bad for search. And so broken that it was it was faster to use websites than to use D D Beyond during a game. But I think they've improved it since. I gave them a bunch of feedback, and uh, and I know they fixed some of the things. And I haven't really. I do have books on here because it's it, as far as I know, it's the only way to get the digital version of fifth edition books. Um, not necess- not not necessarily. I think you can still. I think you can still buy them off of. I think you can still buy them off of Drive Through RPG or the or the or that subversion of Drive Through RPG, which is GM's Vault. Which, um, okay. To anybody who's considering who's considering developing for third party, don't don't go don't go don't do it through DM's Vault. Do it th- do just do it through the old fashioned way with the old with the OGL license. Um, because DM's yeah, why is that? Um, with DM's Vault, the idea is that you're going to get more exposure more exposure, but um, that's up for debate. And Wizards is gonna Wizards is gonna take a bigger cut. Gotcha. Um, I'm not sure if the same thing is applies with Storyteller's Vault, which is Onyx Path's version of it. But um, it wouldn't. But given some of the stories I've ha- I've had um sent to me regarding um Onyx Path, it wouldn't surprise me. Um. So, but D and D Beyond. It's just a rule book compendium, right? I don't see any features, at least on the app here, that do anything like we're talking about in terms of finding a community or other players. Yeah, there's definitely that search problem, and um, I really think that I really think that something that Discord Discord really needs to upgrade is their server browser. Um, because while while they do have a server search functionality in Discord right now, the thing is, it's um. It's very it's very much skewed towards uh, towards official Discord servers for com- for certain communities, and a lot of t- a lot of times people will s- people will create a Discord server solely for a particular game that they're running, and because of that, it's a lot har- it's a lot harder to find it. I think I think if you can't a- search for anything unless there are verified channels, so that yeah. makes it difficult, right? Yeah, and given the and given the fact that a lot a lot of the stuff that I do with with my games um probably isn't get, probably isn't gonna fly with verified channels because I use a fair amount of third party stuff um like when I when I've run I've run I've run um I ran a Pathfinder game once where one of the main um third party source books I was using was um Path of War. Which is basically a spiritual successor to um, the Book of Nine Swords. Okay. And but that but that's a third party material, so that so um. You so using that using that through the through the official end of things is um get, is going to cause some conflicts. And that and I but I do think that the. I think the thing that would definitely help the search functionality is if, in a future update, Discord um, had it so you could put in certain meta tags for servers that you're looking for. Um, mm-hmm. And I realize that means people would have to do work in adding meta tags, but it's not that hard to do that. Um, and in the case of in in the case of D and D Beyond, while I do get the search problem. The other, the bigger issue for me is the is um, I look at the way D and D Beyond presents itself, and the mindset that I get is that they want people to only use first party content as written as possible. Like I, do, Orc Pub at the very least has some has some um system so that somebody could create um custom classes and the like. But beyond, I don't see anything like that for for it. Now, it's been a while since I delved deep into the Beyond app, so I might be um, wrong on that. But 
I like, don't see any third party stuff on Beyond. It's all, it's all you know, wizard stuff. Yeah, it's, now obviously putting all the third party stuff would be imp on one app would be impossible. But I don't th I don't think it's unreasonable to put in some sort of applica some sort of application so that people can store um, custom content, like have some have some sort of means so that you so if you have a document with a custom class, um, say say if you wanted to make if you wanted to make the dragoon class from Final Fantasy in fifth edition, which some people have. Um, have a way to upload that so you could so you could have that searchable under a different kind of tab. Yeah, I don't see any sites that actually do a good job of aggregating user content. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, but I, you know, maybe you can tell me. It's like one thing I've always wanted was some place where I can go find modules that other people have written and have a really and and not just have like a word doc uploaded but actually have it supported in the site where it's in the same format no matter which module it is and so i don't have to learn some author's new format but some place to aggregate user created content for these games um in ter in terms of that there are a few web there are a few websites for D, D at the very least that that have that have addressed this um the D the D and D wiki has do has done this for years, where they where they have just pages upon pages of people's third party content, um of all, of all kinds, and we're mm -hmm. and this is for almost every edition that they have this, um, there's pl of course there's plenty of ways to to search for third party PDFs on places like Drive Through RPG, um, there's but. In something like Tabletop Simulator, being have being the fact that that has integration with Steam Workshop, some people have put modules up there. But when but once you start getting into once you start getting in, into games outside of that particular bubble, then it starts getting a little bit tricky. You can find a fair amount of um, fan made material on official forums for various games. Um. But you are gonna have, but no matter what, you're gonna be doing a bit of sleuthing. Like I, yeah. I would love for, I would love for there to be some equivalent, some uh, tabletop equivalent of Nexus mods. But yep, I, but I think there's just too many games to make that particular kind of thing viable. I, I'd settle for one that just worked for like a major, major gaming system, like you know, like D and D. It's like I, I don't have. I I just checked out D and D Wiki and it's it looks like a website from you know the dawn of the internet. It, <laughs> it's and it it, it it it's not very approachable and you know I'm I'm sitting here like okay where do I find the modules okay the fifth edition homebrew content new classes uh, pages Mod published under OGL. You don't see modules being de being developed thir being developed um third party. In that in in a, in a place like D and D Wiki, as much as you're going to see custom classes or uh, mo or monsters, um, right? You see, I I'd love to go to a place that just had third party modules, and then I'd like and I and I'd even pay. It's like if 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 it was like a I don't know if it worked like Patreon or whatever, but you could have a creators page, and then I could subscribe to that creator, or I could just one off buy a module, name your price like Gum Road, you know, a uh, dollar, mm -hmm. five dollars, whatever, or free. And, um, and, you know, some, some of the most fun times I've had are with non-first party modules. And I would like to be able to find more of them. And, uh, and I don't, I don't find a good place for that yet. Yeah, the, it's, uh, the, it goes, it goes back to that whole issue that, that there is, a, that the tabletop scene is very, is very segmented. I've. I've made the comparison that it's like a chain of islands without any bridges. Okay, you mean do you mean in terms of rule sets or just even within a, a rule set? Um, I mostly mean in terms of overall communication. Like I've hmm. I've had I've had people I've had people who who um have developed various games and who know other people who are developers who didn't know that they were developing a certain game. Okay, and I'm probably you'll do that. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh, I, I'm not. Bl I'm sure. I'm sure you are, and I'm not blaming you for that. 
mm-hmm. but it is it is something that happens. And yeah, I think very few people. Yeah, uh, go ahead. It it's and it's something that happens pri- primarily because of the fact that th- that um there's ve- that there's very little there's ve- that um when it comes to when it comes to options for game developers to communicate with each other the the main the main means the main means that 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 even happens or the main means for a lot of game develop g- tabletop game developers to get any sort of attention is the convention scene and yeah while that's and that's not that many all, people well it's nice and all one that's going to bottleneck the amount of people and and two i think we've all learned that you don't put your all your eggs in uh, one basket In terms of marketing, or just period, because mm-hmm. um, obvious, obviously, with obviously with the whole COVID thing, a lot of people are having harder times getting their getting their names out there. And when when the when the virtual versions of some of these conventions can got canceled over um, politics, um, that ended up re- that ended up taking out other avenues. Um, one of the one of the more recent examples was um, Gamma getting shut down. So what happened with that? Wait, wait, wait is this a, a virtual con or, or no, are you talking I, about the I need, to, con? I need to correct myself. It wasn't Gamma. It was it was going to be an online version of Origins. And okay. Orig- I need to make I need to make something clear. Origins is a big damn deal because the um, the hot, one of the highest honors that a that a that a, a tabletop game can get is getting an Origins award. Um, and the only time they've ever really had a controversy is when AD&D won an award, even though D&D had already won it. Okay. Um, and it was decided it was... And the only other controversy was when a Mass Effect game that was not that was not official ended up slipping into the fan voting part by accident. Uh, okay. Um, the... There's probably there's probably some other controversies, but those are the two main ones that come to mind, and both of them are a ca- both of them are a case of happy accidents. Um, but for a, but for a lot of people, a convention like Origins, which apparently the sole reason that that ended up ended up getting shut down was because was because it didn't go was because it's um it's platitudes it's platitude brand statement. After all, after all the after all, after all the BLM stuff started happening, um, was wasn't wasn't pl- wasn't platitudey enough? I guess, like it wasn't su- it wasn't supporting the cause enough, so people got mad at them, and then the whole thing gets shut down. And my whole thing was, you are taking bread off of so many people's table when it came when it came to that, and a some. When Gen Con ended, when Gen Con um, went full on, went full online, um, that ended up screwing up a lot of people's plans as well for similar reasons. And that's why I, th- I do th- I do think that a lot that a lot more a lot more um, a lot more devs really need to start diversifying how they get their name out there. I think I think a lot <laughs> of I don't. I'm not when I look sh- at, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not trying to throw shade oh, go ahead. when I say this, but I think a lot of them are stuck in the early 2000s. I would agree in terms of marketing and presentation. Um, when I look at the tabletop world, um, let's say the equivalent of Steam for tabletop would be something like Drive Through RPG, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, look at the difference between how a digital storefront is supposed to look in 2010 versus something like drive through RPG, which is like pre Amazon day web layout, right? <laughs> it's like, um, it, it just feels really antiquated in many ways. And even, even roll 20, uh, it all feels like a step behind to me. I think I think part of the I think part of the reason why this why that kind of thing has been accepted is because of how niche tabletop role playing games are. Like everybody yeah. can talk about how it, how accepted it is, like like I said before. But 
when you get down to brass tacks, it's not... But they're really only talking D&D, yeah. Yeah. They're really only talking D&D or Pathfinder or Powered by the Apocalypse. They're, no, matter how man, no matter how many they're talking about, they're talking about a very small pool of games that is a, effectively pissing in the wind. So let, let's contrast that. You know, I would, I would say, if you, if you look at the success of crowdfundings, that board games are a completely different story. Mm-hmm. There you have a lot of people trying a lot of different games uh, versus something like uh, the tabletop scene. And I'm interested, why, why do you think that is? Why do you um, think we see an explosion you do, there? You do have, you do but have not in tabletop. Of, um, you, do have a fair, you do have quite a few successes when it comes to role-playing games on, kick, on um, crowdfunding as well. I do, I do want to point that out. Um, and in, and in fact, I, and in fact, um, several companies, that's the main, that's the main way they get their, they get their stuff out there is through places like, um, Kickstarter. Um, yeah, but they're not, they're not doing what these tabletop companies are doing, pulling down one to two million, unless you're like, uh, Numera or whatever, you know, um, um well, in the case, like, well, something you have to keep in mind with, um, something like Numenera is that's from Monty Cook. Like yep. that. And he is the brand. Yeah, yeah, he he is the brand. When it comes to some something like something like say the the current crowdfund for the Empty Thrones for Earth Dawn, that's coming out from Fasa. So and Fasa is an established name. Um, Level ninety nine games, who's putting who's putting out a board game that's that's um inspired by shmups. Yes, I yes I know how that sounds, and it actually works. Um. Has been do, has been doing Kickstarters in one form or another for about a decade. Um, I know I know people like to you. The only the only real um controversy that happened in in board the only major controversy that happened in board and tabletop when it came to Kickstarters on the level of the Kickstarters that people like to poke fun at was the Evil Dead incident, and that was a case of somebody taking the money and running. Um, but it, but it ended up getting rescued by a different company. So that story at least had a happy ending. So, so you think that, well, so now you're saying that there, there is a, a vibrant sort of Kickstarter crowd for, uh, tabletop RPGs. Every, one of these, one of the segments that I have on the monastery, in fact, it's the first segment that I open every show with is the Kickstarter spotlight. Where I go through various kick, various kickstarters. Some of them do really well. Some of them struggle, um, and so, and some of them fall fall right in the middle. But there is no lacking in variety, and not all of them are um, are th- are um, D are D and D based. Um, one of the recent ones I highlighted, a game called Bite, is a is a um, is a universal is a universal style RPG with a significantly lighter um, rule set than GURPS, but is using its is using its own proprietary system. There's plenty. There's plenty of. The thing is, is that there is that you can always fi- you with a sufficient amount of digging, you can always find something. Um, and there's and there's been certain projects that Kickstarter has done that. Are, that are rooted in tabletop gaming. One of the one of the more recent infamous examples was the Break Kickstarter project or the um, Quick Starter projects, where people would put out these very short, low cost um, Kickstarters. Mm-hmm. And when I say low cost, I'm saying that the high end of these of these Quick Starters was like a hundred. Some some were some okay. were trying to raise like fifty. Some were trying to raise like fifty dollars in two weeks. <laughs> wow. Okay. So there's there's a significant when it comes to crowdfund, that's where a, that's where a lot of people get their stuff out there these days. I'd I actually, see that. That's a, that's a way to get visibility. I'd actually say that I'd actually say that crowdfunding has done more to help the tabletop scene than it ha- than crowdfunding has helped the video game scene. Yeah. Well. You're talking about tabletop RPGs, not mm-hmm. not tab- not board games, right? Um, in this particular case, both bo- both um both board games and both board games and um are, 
both board games and RPGs fall fall into this um, vibrancy when it comes to kick when it comes to crowdfunding. Well, yeah, but there's an but I'm particularly interested in the difference between tabletop RPGs mm -hmm. and board and tabletop games. And it seems to me that, you know, a tabletop RPG might pull in at the high end if, if you're not like Monty Cook, you know, maybe 20K, right? But a, a board game is just more than not going to explode and raise hundreds of thousands of dollars in many more cases. And, uh, and I'm, I've always been interested about why do we see such an explosion in people exploring board games versus tabletop? And I suspect it's a matter of investment. If, if I buy a board game, uh, I don't need a DM. I don't have to make a campaign. I can just sit down with my friends and we can just all play. And the content's all provided for. And the, the rules only take, you know, maybe an hour to digest, uh, if, if even. Versus, you know, if you want to get into a tabletop role-playing game, someone's got to be DM. Someone's got to be creating the content or, or refereeing the content. And... Um, and you don't have a case where the rules you can just read and pick up and go. It's a much more investment to to learn about character creation, uh, to learn about how combat's done, and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's my guess, anyways. It it's it's not too far off, and what what definitely what definitely puts um puts um board puts board games in a bit and a bit of favor is. There's already several established um, companies that you that do that have done board gaming kickstarters fairly regularly. In fact, in some cases, they'll announce months in advance um, what they're kickstarting. Um, one of the one of the big one of the big movers and shakers is um, Simon, C M O N. Yep. And mm -hmm. Grant, and in the, in their case, something that definitely helps is some of the licenses that they've that they've acquired. Like they've they've made they've made a board game based on um based on Devil May Cry. They've made a board game based on God of War. They've made a they made board games based on a, a fair amount of very well known IPs. Yep. And but even 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 before they acquired those licenses, they had a very healthy track record of Kickstarters for original IPs that they had reaching you know many times well above the million dollar mark. Yeah. I mean, they were very successful at crowdfunding. Yeah, and I def so, and I definitely think that's that self con that self contained approach helps. the other, the The thing that I ended up learning from looking at all these different kickstarters since I, since I've been doing this podcast for about two years, and because of that, I've seen a lot of different kickstarters um, of different qualities. And one of the things that I've learned is very important is what we call pre gaming. Where you have, where um, your the Kickstarter eff effectively is your resume. You are tr in a resume. You're trying to sell yourself to a company and and try and convince why that company should hire you. In a Kickstarter, you're trying to sell your idea and trying to convince people why they should put money into it. Mm -hmm. And. Some and um sometimes I find that I find that the best way to do it is but is by showing demonstrations. Like if you look at a lot of board game Kickstarters, they'll have like two or three videos from different YouTubers showing actual play demonstrations. You sometimes see this with role playing games, but not especially often. The other thing that definitely helps is putting out a um quick start PDF or some sort of rule book to explain how it's going to work. Yes. A lot of the board game ones will put out their rule book in PDF form on the Kickstarter page. Yep. It, I like that. I like seeing the quick start rules and being able to prove them. I like your idea even more of <clears throat> having a basic video, a very polished, nice video on YouTube saying, hey, here's how, you know, here's how to create a character. Here's how character creation goes. And then maybe another segment on, here's, you know, here's three rounds of combat and how to play it. Mm-hmm. You know that would that would go a long way. I think it mo it definitely does. Um, in some in some cases they in some cases 
like one thing that I've one thing that I've seen a few times, and some of the people who've done who've done this I've had on the show previously, um, they go out of they go out of their way to to give the visual to give the visual and and even auditory feel for their particular game. Two two examples that I that immediately come to my head. Um, one of them is Mork Borg, which is very Swedish doom metal influenced. And they, <laughs> they even set up a Spotify playlist of of the official, unofficial kind of music that includes stuff from bands like Earth and um, Bolt Thrower. Not, not Earth, Wind, and Fire, just Earth. Okay. Um, which is, as, and I think also a few tracks from Sun. Very funeral doom, very atmospheric, very listen to this with headphones on kind of thing. And um, against the Dark Master, who, in the interest of full disclosure, the developer that is is a, is a friend of mine, and we shit talk each other constantly. <laughs> his whole his whole thing with that is t- is taking is taking the old Middle Earth role play rules and in, and infusing that with heavy metal. To the point where he has he has a graphic called "Make Criticals Hurt Again," <laughs> and, okay. and set up a set up a Spotify playlist for his game that in, that includes includes a little bit of Deep Purple, a little bit of Rhapsody of Fire, a little bit of Rotting Christ, a, a, a fair amount of Man of War and Priest, um, just to give kind of the vi- the auditory vibe for his particular game. And those those sort that sort of presentation goes goes a long way because mm-hmm. ag- again at the end at the end of the day the, a Kickstarter is a, is a case of saying here's here's why I here's why I believe you should spend you should spend money on our work. Yep. No, I I, I agree with that. It's like. And, and I see a lot of again that sort of dichotomy where it feels like tabletop role playing game uh, creators and companies have not yet caught up to 2010. Like I see a lot of their presentation being very retro and not taking full advantage of, like you said, you know, having some YouTube playthroughs or or anything else like that to really make that resume that you talk about sparkle. Right, so I, I, you know, to me, it, it's it's a little frustrating to see, and and I kind of want to get in there. I, I want to like, you know, I would love to. Uh, obviously, I don't have the, the, the time for any of this, but I'll, I'll throw the ideas out there. I would like to see something like Steam for tabletop games. I would like to see, um, you know, a, a website where I can go and, and easily ha- access tons of user created uh, modules and, and campaigns. Uh, I'd love to see a better version of Roll20 that had more integration with, say, Discord or, you know, um, you know, or even game engines to feature, you know, like I see a friend of mine subscribes to a Patreon for interactive D&D maps, which are just gorgeous, right? Mm-hmm. They're 3D rendered, and they have moving water and everything else, but they're fixed. There's no editor. And it's just a video that you download, and you play it on a TV, and then you put your miniatures on top of the TV and walk them through the grid that way. And the TV has to be a fixed size because it, you know, it can only be I don't know what it is, thirty-two inches or something, because otherwise it won't be an inch per square. And it, it, it's like almost there. It's like almost there. It's like if someone just gave me a dungeon editor, you know, on my iPad, and I could, I could, I could fling that together, and then we could play it. Even on the iPad, I mean, talk about Fog of War, right? It's like this is a a, a thirteen inch iPad is a is a pretty regular screen. So you've got you know, let's say twelve by ten squares, and uh, and you could scroll around that way. That'd be pretty cool. Um, the closest that I can think to that kind of thing, and this is this is not out yet. It's still in development, but but it's just something to keep an eye on. Look first. There's a little something called Tailspire that. Um, that got that got funded not too long ago and is currently in development. Tailspire, like T A I L. T A L E. Oh, T A L E. I okay. I see it here on Steam. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's early access. So, what is that exactly? Um, so, that is a dungeon editor. Pretty pretty much. I'm not saying it's going to be exactly what you're shooting for, but 
I am seeing things in, in that direction, and um, there's also something I came across not too long ago called Vector, that while it's being used for board games, I could see it being used for um, role-playing games. Um, it's the technology is not quite there yet. It's gonna it's gonna be some it's gonna be some time before it is at that particular level. But I do like that progress is being made towards that. And I think it's a great opportunity now because of of COVID. I think you know these types of tools are going to become more important. Oh, de- oh, that's de- that is that's definitely the case. Um, but with that, with that said, um, oh, they raised a lot. I just yeah. found their Kickstarter. They raised like three hundred seventy-four thousand dollars to mm-hmm. create this app. Yeah, and the only reason I've been I'm a little bit hesitant is um is I get the feeling it's gonna be um it's gonna be a bit fantasy centric. So if I want to run something a little more cyberpunk, I might have to wait a while. Um, but there's been there's been some other there's been some other approaches, and obviously. I'm always on the I'm always on the lookout to see what people are working on. Yeah, that looks pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I don't know much about it yet. I don't know it, if it's an editor or if it's a I guess a, a hero crafting system. Build your own minis. That's pretty popular now too. Is um, I forget the big site out there that lets you create your own mini and then have it printed. Uh, hero Forge. Sent to you. Hero Forge. Yeah, they're doing pretty well, aren't they? Yeah, they're they. I remember, I remember when I first found out about them, and I saw the potential in it, but it was de- it was definitely so- it was definitely something that um, was still raw at that point. And mm-hmm. no- and now it's it's the de- it's gone through significant advances. And there's a lot. There is a significant amount more variety now than there than there was a few years ago. Yeah, um, I think that they they've done a lot. I don't like their sculpts, and you know it's like not my style. And every everyone's kind of feels a little bit like a a chibi character, you know, kind of big head, small body, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. But I think that's just because of the limits of of three D printing. Um, you know, although although I think printers have gotten a lot better. Yeah, and I need to correct myself. It wasn't Vector. That was the name of that board game project. It's Vorpal Board. Vorpal Board. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, things like Hero Forge. I mean, that seems up to snuff to me. That's definitely cutting edge, modern. You know, and I think there's there's room for for more innovation like this in tabletop, um, which I think would make make things a lot more. Uh, accessible too, in yeah. terms of easy to find resources, easy to find other games, that type of thing. And I think what definitely help what definitely helps is one trend I've seen in board games is um put is having in, is having um smartphone integration. Yes. Um, a couple of examples that come that come to mind for that are things like um, Golem Arcana. Created by um, ha- created by the always awesome Hairbrain schemes, and the XCOM board game that Fantasy Flight put out, and I will admit a bit of bias in favor of Fantasy Flight because we're both from Minnesota. <clears throat> um, but th- but I know I know some people are gonna are gonna. The sole reason that I end up highlighting these kind of things is because. Due to due to how some people have sw- have swallowed the proverbial Kool Aid, it would be very easy to say, "Oh, oh, oh, oh the ga- the gaming industry is going down the shitter," or "Oh, the tabletop industry is going down the shitter." When there's plenty of people putting out interesting stuff that would kill for just a look for just a little bit of atten- just a little bit of attention to show, "Hey, we're actually putting stuff that people would want to spend money on." Right. It's like hyper sarcasm is the lowest form of wit and hyperbole is even lower. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, I wonder. I wonder if tabletop will 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 ex- 
explode the way that tabletop role playing it will explode the way that board games have. I would like to see that, but you know, I think you're right. I think it's, it's kind of relegated to the big three. I think I think that my prediction on what my prediction on what's going to happen is is this and i will i will admit that this that obviously i don't have a i don't have a crystal ball on this this is this is just me um looking at the way things have gone and and uh, what and what's likely to happen eventually the whole the whole the whole big there's the whole um the whole idea of big celebs play, the whole idea of big celebs playing video games with this with a shock value of Hey, your hey your favorite your favorite film movie stars or what or whatever plays D and D too and is a nerd too. That's going to lo- That's going to lose its um specialness because when because when everybody's a, when everybody's a nerd is anybody a nerd? Um. And what's going what's going to happen is that is that the bubble that. Um, the, that the OGL is in is going to burst because I I can't confirm this obviously, but I've been hearing rumblings that there has been talk about doing a sixth edition in the next five years, probably because of the fact that Pathfinder's come out with a second edition, one which I'm still mixed on, but that's beside the point. But what I do, but. What I do think is going to happen is that a lot of the, a lot of the people who just who just watch Twitch aren't going to be dedicated enough to actually get into the game, and that's going to wane. But but the people who do who do stick around are going to be um, more dedicated. So you're gonna you're gonna see a, you're gonna see a cr- you're going to see a crunch, and. I'm not going to I can't say that it's going to that it's going to um explode. I know some people are saying that now, but I think now what you're seeing right now is a bubble, not not a not a full on growth because it's going too it's going too quickly and we saw how flying too how flying too fast too soon worked with um stuff like Mixer. <laughs> um Right. But what's but what's going to ha- what I think is going to happen is when that's when that sixth edition inevitably comes out, you're going to see a massive rift. You're go, you're going to see a you're going to see Edition Wars 2.0, and you're going to see a lot of disunion among that Twitch crowd. When sixth edition comes out, I don't know when it's going to come out, but I know it's going to happen eventually. Right, it's, and why do you think it's going to split then? Because because of the because of the fact that for one, this always happens. I've seen this I've seen this sort of splitting happen every single goddamn time. Like I, I saw this sort I saw this sort of split all the way back in two thousand. With some with some really really dumb takes, I think the dumbest of which was that with thir- that with third edition wizards was. Turning D and D into Diablo, I swear by the holiest of holies, <laughs> that was said completely unironically to me. Which well, I, I well, fourth edition they said it was turning into WoW. Yeah, and on and honestly, I find I find both of those complaints overblown. I find I treat I treat it like the guy who says that Call of Duty sucks when they've never played a Call of Duty game. Mm-hmm. It's like. No, Call of Duty doesn't suck. Everything after Modern Warfare Two sucks, or not Modern Warfare Two, Black Ops Two. So you think we're in a bubble right now? Where I think I think I think we're in I think we are in a I think we are in a bit of a um, bubble, but because and because of how, because of how aggressive this push is for um, Fifth Edition, and because of the fact that D, that um, Wizards of the Coast. Is only interested in in promoting one particular style of play with Fifth Edition, like the and what style of play, play is that? when it comes to just, say, just so people know what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when it comes to the when it comes to things like holdings or things like followers or or things like mass combat, Wizards of the Coast seems very disinterested in these particular play styles. They are more interested in the in the murder in the murder hobo shit. Which I have nothing against the murder hobo shit, but 
there, but when you consider all the other things that you can do and have been done with um, with D and D over over the last thirty years, you're there's no reason to bottleneck yourself like that. And I think because there because because of both because this notion of them trying to create this very controlled experience through that, and the fact that they're more interested in looking backwards. Um, an excellent case in point is the fact that there have been there have been more modules that are based on older material than modules that introduce new ideas. Really? You think? Are they? What are they doing? Reissuing stuff or? Um, it's the and when I say I say when I say modules, I mean a mix of modules and settings because of the fact that they do that kind of a la carte thing. The most recent. It's the most recent mod, the most recent, um, like when it when it comes to ones that are introducing new things, there's Theros, which was a which was a um adaptation of a magic set. There was the Ravnica thing because oh, fucking course apparently. Yep, look, I'm sick of Ravnica. All right, <laughs> um, <laughs> like give give me give me something like Mirrodin for God's sake, and. The, and um the will and the Wildemont thing which was um which was which was ba which was based on the setting that critical role had had developed the most okay. re the most recent expansion that's been put out that's gonna be that's gonna be put out is icewind dale i.e more forgotten realms and I knew it was a bad idea when they decided to imply that forgotten realms was going to be the default setting at Say what you will about fourth edition, but at the very least, they had a better setting variety in the first party. You ha Manual of the Plains was Spelljammer in all but name. They brought back Dark Sun. They they um they made a genuine attempt to to have a established default setting instead of the half in half out problem that D and D has had for years. And this. Partic this particular thing is going to is going to come to a head. You're going to see more and more people who get dissatisfied with just doing the standard style of play, and they're either they're either going to they're either going to burn out or they're going to look for other games. I'm not saying that there's going to be some sort of mass exodus, but you're going to see a slow bleed. Um, I'd. I'd, I suppose I suppose the best at the best the best analogy I can come up with is when Wrath of the Lich King came out. I, be, okay. I began to predict a problem that was go, that was going to bite World of Warcraft um, in the ass, and that was the fact that the the classes that were coming out were all were all ones that could fill all three roles, but single role classes weren't given anything to compensate. Right, and I knew I knew that this was going to paint that this was going to paint them into a corner eventually. And when I saw that they completely nuked the skill tree si system, I took that as a sign that I was right. And <laughs> in the in the in the case of in the case of D and D, you're going to you're going to see people who are not satisfied with the st with that st with the standard adventuring style of play that you might get when you're just starting out um or the, or a tre or treating or treating modules like their DL like their DLC adventures and having this sort of controlled experience the way magic is a controlled experience that is going to backfire because people are going to want as pe as people play more and more, they're going to want more variety, and I'm already getting complaints from some people of how their campaigns end up playing the same set of characters over and over because because of because of that lack of variety, since they neutered a lot of variety in the name of accessibility. Yeah, that's definitely sort of like a trap that you get into when you're making an MMO, mm -hmm. and. While while the accessibility trap isn't exactly this isn't exactly the same in tabletop development, it does it does kind of mix in like a Venn diagram with it. And 
that's the reason why I say when a sixth edition is an, is announced or get, or gets in development, it's go, this kind of thing is going to come to a head, because then they're going to have all these different. It's already hard enough with all these different sort of audience that you need audiences that you need to appease, and that's just going to make things worse. So I do. Th I, that's the reason why I say that it, that th that it's in a bubble because the question that I have is, all those people who jumped on because of the popularity of Critical Role. When that show event, when that show eventually shifts onto something else, are they going to stay? And I'm not confident that they are. Well, how, I mean, probably. What percentage of Critical Role is actually playing D and D versus watching D and D? I can't. Obviously, I wouldn't be able to get the numbers for that, but I don't suspect it's a very high ratio. I get I get the feeling that the people who are watching Critical Role and playing are in a minority versus versus the people who are just watching a show and um there's also the there's also the issue of what's been called the Mercer effect where people have where people think that they need to copy DM Matt Mercer on on how he DMs and while he's tried to address it and act like it's not really that much of a thing um, I find I find the way he addressed it hollow. Mm. But that's that's kind of that's kind of the prediction that I that I have that a lot of those people won't won't uh, come won't be won't be jumping back in because I look at say professional the way that WWF was in the uh, in the nineties when a lot of the big stars left. It didn't okay. it didn't mean that everybody else got ju got jumped up. It it meant everybody everybody else um, suffered from less business too. So, you th so you think it's going to be a bubble? You think the audience is going to shrink again once uh, Critical Role is is older and passe because you know, it's kind of these, these things are kind of fads, right? Mm -hmm. Um. That's in, that's interesting. So, and 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 you think that that's going to actually uh, shrink the market? And then, do you think that that will cement the leader's position, or do you think that that'll be an opportunity? Um, I don't think you're going to see some sort of us usurpation. And the and um, Wizards of the Coast desperately wants to avoid another wants to avoid another Pathfinder situation. Um. I do think that if that if that sixth edition get, that when that sixth edition gets announced, that's going to be a pivotal point because of how they ha not only how they handle it, but how they handle the open gaming license, because that's that's been a that's been a gray area issue for years, um, especially after that whole Rob Bodine incident earlier this year, where where um he where he exposed some of the flaws with the open gaming license and how. Well, the prob well, the big problem is it's not a contract. Like you, somebody doesn't technically have to have to put it in. It's just put in as a kind of handshake agreement. Um, okay. And that that's a that's a that's a slimmed down version of it because I don't want to get into the to the legalese of of that matter. But it is it is very much a it is very much a bubble because. And the re the reason why I felt it was is because the people I saw who were watching Critical Role more often than not weren't playing the game or or um were or if they were they were reliant too much on what they had seen in that and not on and not on building their own approach. Um. To the and in in some in some cases I I saw one rookie try to get in and they had books from different editions that didn't match up and I was like what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. And that's that's the way that that's the way that I that's the reason why I say the uh, bubble thing and why um how Wizards presents a 6th edition is going to be interesting. I know they want to claim that they're going to be doing 5th edition for years to come but Eventually, eventually, the um, power the power creep problem is going to rear its ugly head, and the system is going to get too bloated. This that's not that's not a criticism of the of the way the mechanics work. This is just something that happens. And because of and because of that, when that ha when that happens, and when um, 
when the when the new factor of celebrities playing D and D starts to starts to wane, the casual the casual audience is going to go with it. What I think is going to happen after that is there will be the appearance of a market shrink, and you will see a bunch of larger companies make a panic move. But I think mm -hmm. I think it'll also I think that'll make things. I'm not going to say full on easier, but a little bit more amenable to um to to third to third parties and independents because of the, because of the fact that they're not going to have some some big company breathing down their neck about how they're supposed to be doing it. Right. Like Dean tabletop gaming will always be niche. I don't think that's ever going to change. Mm -hmm. What I do think is going to change is ha is is the is the way that it is um, niche. Um, that's now of course, I could be completely full of shit with this, and I do and yeah the yeah the sh the shrink part is is definitely is definitely going to be something that ev that everybody will feel. But I do, th I do think it'll be like ripping off a bandaid. It's gonna hurt at first, but you're, but you're gonna be better afterwards. So, because uh, the hobby will come back to the fold, <laughs> the core audience. <laughs> and, yeah. Maybe, yeah, I can see that. Now and of course, of course, like I said before, take take all this with a grain of salt because this is just my prediction with how things are um mo are moving. Mm -hmm. It there there's there the the other thing the other thing that I feel I feel I need to take take into account is the fact that the the real the real the real rising the real rising star. That I th that should that should be kept an eye on long term, is not Wizards of the Coast or Paizo. It's Pinnacle. Pinnacle. How come? Pinnacle is the developer of Savage Worlds, and mm -hmm. they and they have a and they have a far they have a far more open relationship. And from what I've been told by some. They are a lot more friendly towards their third-party developers, and so they have a really good outreach program for that. They do. They do. They ha they they have a very they have a very good outreach. They um they reg they regularly highlight people's um people's fan people's fan works with with it within um the Savage World system. And even even the new even the new adventure edition, or as it's nicknamed, Swade, is not is not doing too is is not causing as much of a, of a rift as I would have thought it would have. Like there there was there was some there were some difficulties for some because of uh, because of timing issues, um since it since it was announced right in the middle of them developing their own things, but. People seem to have adapted to the to the uh, change in rule set pretty quickly, and I haven't really seen a whole lot of addition warring with Savage Worlds. What's the appeal of Savage Worlds? I guess it's kind of a, a generalist system. You can sort of make your own setting for it, or Savage Worlds lends itself far more to pulpy style of play. The one of the key appeals with its mechanics is speed, since um. Instead of instead of using straight instead of using straight numbers for its modifiers, it uses dice from d4 to d12. So instead mm -hmm. of saying you've got two ranks in strength, you have a d6 in strength. When you roll a strength and a skill die. You compare that to a target number. Um, okay. You have the whole Benny's thing. Um, initiative isn't rolled. It's de it's determined through drawing cards from a from a standard 52 card deck. Um, mm -hmm. It's all it's all about speed, and that's why it lends itself very well to that style of to the to the kind of pulp adventure style. I first found out about it during during the during its relaunch of Deadlands and the Savage Worlds version of Solomon Kane, i.e., my favorite Robert E. Howard character. 
Mm-hmm. And it's that it's that whole it's that whole concept of of speed that I think is at the core of its appeal, as well as the as well as the fact that it's Savage Worlds is a very flexible system without being overwhelming. So it's in the happy medium of people who want to customize on the level of something like GURPS, but don't want to deal with GURPS's calculus level math. Right. Okay. So you think that that they've got a lot of promise because of their third party support network? I yeah, I think I think be, I think because of that they're I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that they're gonna be over that they're gonna be overtaking the big two, but they are somebody to they are somebody to keep an eye on, um, especially since they have been ve- they have been very consistent with their um with their quality control. Mm-hmm. And again, again, it comes it comes back to having this having the strong support network. Having strong support networks is, I think, where. You're go is where you're going to see the the um the actual movers and shakers within the dedicated tabletop scene. Gotcha. I I realized that was a I realized that was a bit wordy, and that is me making um pr- making predictions like I'm like I'm some sort of industry analyst, which I'm just a I'm just a jackass with a mic. <laughs> but well, I don't I don't know I I find your insights. Uh... You're about as close to an industry analyst that, that I think it comes. I mean, you you highlight so many rule sets. You you read so many rule sets. You really keep an eye on this stuff. I mean, I don't know too many other people who who do that t- type of thing. So I think you're you can call yourself an analyst. I I'll, you know I'll I'll, I'll grant that. <laughs> <laughs> but now with the, with with that with that said. Um, I do want to sincerely thank you for t- for taking the time to to come onto the sh- to come onto the uh, show, um, and and hopefully hopefully when t- when time comes I'll I'll have an excuse to br- to bring you back again hopefully so we can do shit talking about about why Gungrave is better than Trigun. <laughs> Wait a second now, <laughs> them spiting words. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to come back and, and talk about that, and hopefully I'll be a little bit farther along with Gate Striders too, my mm-hmm. base opera tabletop that I'm working on, uh, and I'd love to come back and talk about that once um, I'm doing a revision of the rule set. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've you've seen an early set, and and I'm com- I'm a complete newbie to this, and this mm-hmm. this podcast has actually helped me figure out a couple things, like you know. Um, it, it seems like I should really just focus on the type of game that I want to play and the types of things and adventures that I want to have to do because there's no competing with the big guys. You know, it's, it's either you're, you're the top three IPs or everything else. And I think rather than chasing that, I just want to chase what I want to chase was kind of a space opera feel where you actually have adventures in where everyone has a spacecraft and you can have adventures in your spacecraft, not just as your characters. So, um, so that helped me answer that question, mm-hmm. and you know, and some of the other ones about story based versus how crunchy to make it. Uh, this has all been very entertaining. So thank you for having me on the podcast. I would love to come back and talk further. It mm-hmm. seems like a good time. Yeah, and obviously, obviously, I was be- I was being in jest with that. I just figured I'd I'd make that kind of jab because well, both of them are made by the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> That may be true, but one is better. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's gonna that's gonna be a t- that's gonna be a t- a topic all 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 on its own. But um, I def I definitely look forward to having you back. And um, as I often say here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Awesome. Maybe next time I'll join you for a drink. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that coming comes from, especially since later tonight will be the the debut episode of Geek Watch, and we're going to be tackling a bit of a discussion on what we've called the Space Western trilogy of anime, because after all after all the insanity and all the and all the wokeness, we need a pl- I need a platform where I can where I can just bring some of the good brothers and talk about geek shit, and thus the watch has been born. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, 
I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.